Welcome to the Grim Leftover Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. You betcha, baby. We are ready to rock and roll on another Monday evening here. Yes, it's October 7th, 2019. I am Grimnir, and this is episode 42 of the Grim Leftovers program. Yeah, man, that's been that's 42 weeks now, been going, been going. So, uh, yeah, I'm ready to do another for you all. So, welcome to everybody out there on all the various places you may be tuned in from. Yeah, we got a lot of places. You could be there on reallibertymedia.com, either listening from the sidebar or on the Grim Leftovers show page. You may be listening in on RLM Radio. Dot .xyz or freedomsnetwork.com, realliberty.org. Maybe you're listening directly on, on the stream link there, uh, which is available. And, um, oh, who knows, wherever else, internet, radio, tune in, shotcast.com, just all kinds of wonderful places you may be listening in from. So welcome to everybody out there, but welcome to all the folks here in the chat. Let me see who I see active and chatting right now. We got the Java Doctor, we got Kate, we got Gooberzilla, SLC Mike, Mr. Cowboy Tech, uh, we got Hansel, uh, Juzus, yeah, just uh, just all kinds of folks over here hanging out in the chat room, and a whole bunch of other people I didn't mention, because I don't see them as being active at this point in time. That don't mean they're not listening, just means they're not currently active here in uh, the chat. Yes, episode 42, the answer to life, the universe. And everything. <laughs> of course, what's the question? That's really the problem. <laughs> you got to know the question if you want if you want the answer to make any sense. Um, so, <laughs> oh man, so it's it's been cooling off nicely uh, over over here in uh, central New Mexico. Yeah, cooling off quite nicely. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think uh, I think the garden's about had it. I got one. I got one watermelon. It's only about half the size I'd really like it to be, but I guess I'll harvest it because it's getting down to where it's going to start to get into the frost mode in the morning. The tomatoes that haven't grown fully, I'll let them keep going until they don't. But so far, they're still growing. As far as I can tell, they're green yet. Um, but I'm thinking for next year, rather than what I had been thinking, I'm thinking for next year, I'm just going to grow stuff that is native to the area, uh, rather than, than trying to go for these other kind of things, you know, um, I, I'm, I, and working on the trees, I want a bunch of trees, so uh, at least apple trees, maybe some pecans, or something along that line, other other things that grow well out here, and then some, some of the shrubberies that grow, uh, like, like the white sage, and I think I have some white sage growing, I took some pictures earlier, but I, I haven't posted them up yet. I'll show people pictures of that later on. And you can tell me whether or not, hey, yeah, that's actually white sage. Because uh, I think I got some. <laughs> anyway, so I'm thinking about doing that for next year, uh, rather than going for a whole vegetable garden type thing. Eh, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, I, I haven't absolutely decided anything yet, but uh, so I, you know, got to get through the winter first. So anyway, let's get going here. I got a bunch of stories lined up for you, as I said. Hopefully, you've all got your tinfoil hats on, the industrial strength tinfoil hats on and strapped in tightly, because uh, a lot of the stuff I have for you today, yeah, it may sound like maybe you need a tinfoil hat to believe any of it, especially put yourself in the mindset of where you were prior to September 11th, 2001. <laughs> and and try and take the stories that I share with you today, or any really any of the stories you see anywhere, uh, the, the coming out these days, and try and put your mindset uh, into the mind space where you were September tenth, two thousand one. Because yeah, it's a different world, man. It's a different world. Anyway, this first story, maybe not, not, not so much <laughs> from that era, but, uh, uh, but it's a story that I like because, well, I'm a big fan of taking naps. I like naps. Naps are good. 
And apparently, they actually are good. Now, I don't know when this was initially posted. I didn't say it about a month ago, but they updated it uh, today, so I, I don't have a... Oh, wait. No, they didn't update it today. What am I thinking? Oh, posted September 10th. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> My mind. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah, dates confuse me. Time confuses me. Anyway, here we go from the New York Post. People who nap regularly may be less likely to suffer a heart attack. You don't want a heart attack, do you? No. <laughs> I imagine most of you don't anyway. Maybe some of you do. I don't know. Uh, anyway, sure, there are chores to be done, but go ahead and take that nap instead. For your health! A couple of midday naps in a week has been linked with a lower risk of heart attack and stroke, according to a new study published in the British Medical Journal. But... Nap too much, they say, and the positive impact is lost. So, you gotta be a, a little frugal with your napping. Nap when, when you really feel it, and don't nap when, just don't nap for the sake of napping. Researchers began analyzing health and sleep data in 2009 from 3,642 randomly se selected participants age 35 to 75 in uh, Lausanne, Switzerland, who were recruited through the Swiss National Health Survey, Kolaus. Scientists asked, first asked about their previously weekly nap frequency and continued monitoring them for an average of five years per, per participant. Most, 58%, did not nap regularly. About one in five people, 19%, said they took one or two naps in a week. And about 10 uh, percent or 12 percent uh, took naps, three to, three to five naps weekly, with about the same share, 11 percent taking naps daily or nearly daily. Those who did not nap at all had a 48 percent higher likelihood of experiencing a stroke, heart attack, or failure compared to those who napped once or twice a week. The result held up against age, nighttime sleep duration, and the daytime sleepiness, uh, blood pressure, and other cardiovascular disease risk failure factors, and depression. Only those with severe sleep apnea, or age 65 and up, were excluded from the benefits. However, those who napped between three and seven times a week had a 67% increase in the risk of heart-related risks. So, yeah, seven times a week napping, that's once a day. Uh, yeah, that's, that's going to bump you up into the risk, risk zone, according to the study. Whether or not that's accurate and true, it's a study. So often, older men, sleep apnea sufferers, smokers, and overweight people had those problems. Uh, they also slept longer hours overnight and still reported more daytime sleepiness. However, that risk was all but eliminated when those risk factors were removed. No link between nap duration and cardiovascular events was found. Nap. How long is a nap for you? Beetle says two hours. Um, I'm lucky to get an hour, you know. And, and I don't I know that I really need more than an hour of a nap. Um, because, uh, you, you know, after, after even like 30 minutes nap, I, uh, it's, it's like I, I kind of wake up and, wow, what did, what did I post there? I posted something wrong. That's not what I meant to post. <laughs> oh, that is what I meant to post. Never mind. <laughs> Barman confused me because he tweeted right after I posted the link. Oh, man. So uh, take your naps a couple times a week. Yeah. Yeah, and that's good. That's good. A couple naps a week and you'll be... You'll be sitting pretty, according to this study. <laughs> oh, this next one, I know we talked about it in the chat. I, I don't believe I talked about it on uh, either Freakers or here yet. So I'm going to talk about it again, because it's important to some people. Because I like bacon. I like ham. I like pork chops. I like pork roast. Pretty much all of the, the main good cuts of pork I like. But I don't like spending a lot of money for it. 
Well, too bad, so sad. <laughs> From Asia Times, posted on September 10th. Hogageddon, Hogageddon, forces, uh, forces up pork prices in China. African swine fever results in a 46.7% price surge in August, fueling a rise in fu food, food inflation. <laughs> fueling a rise in food inflation. Yes, easy to say, right? Okay. <laughs> Hog again! Yes. Forced up food inflation in China last month as pork prices surged by 46.7%, on the back of an African swine fever epidemic in the world's second largest economy. The year-on-year -year jump illustrated the depth of the problem after millions of pigs were slaughtered or died from the outbreak. Data from the National Bureau of Statistics showed that the cost of food in the Official Consumer Price Index, or CPI, jumped 10% in August compared to the same period last year. Significantly, that was the highest level in more than seven years. Consumer price inflation should accelerate in the coming months as pig stocks continue to fall. Julian Evans Pritchard and Martin Rasmussen, economists with the Capital Economics, wrote in a note released on Tuesday of that week. The knock-on effect also hit beef, mutton, and chicken prices. So all your meats way up which soared by 11.6 to 12.5% last month compared to the same period in 2018. Unseasonal weather continued to play havoc with fresh fruit prices, again, another bump up, by 24% year-on-year, although it was uh, down from July's 39% rise. So it went up 39%, it went up another 24%. Uh, I... I <laughs> The basics of this is you're going to be paying more for food. You're going to be getting less food for the, for your dollar. Uh, but the upcoming reserve requirement ratio cuts announced last Friday are in line with our view that rampant food price inflation is not a barrier to monetary easing. Speak for yourself. Uh, and we continue to anticipate further loosening in the next few months, quarters. Um, they were referring to the decision last week by the People's Bank of China to reduce the amount of funds banks have to hold in reserve in a move to stimulate the economy as the trade war with Trumpster drags on. Still, it was the rise in pork prices, which have grabbed the headlines during the past three months. Up to 200 million pigs could die or be culled in China this year, after contracting African swine fever. If that happens, pork prices could soar by 70%, according to a senior Chinese official. So stock up on your bacon and ham and whatever else, uh, if you got a freezer to put some of that stuff in. Uh, yeah, okay, um, SLC Mike puts out here, Utah hog farm, part of the $7.1 billion Chinese deal. Um, I assume that would tie in with this, but if it's a Utah hog farm, farm, they're probably not getting that African swine flu. Um, so maybe China is buying those hog farms to, to kind of bolster their stock of, of pork over there. So I, I don't know. I don't know. <sighs> I don't use Facebook. I know some of you use Facebook. But According to this, maybe I should use Facebook because maybe they could tell me something I personally don't even know about myself. <laughs> now, some of y'all out there use Facebook, and some of you probably already know. I, I can't remember. It's been a while. I mean, a while. <laughs> Here you go. From SputnikNews.com, posted on the... Uh, what, 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 what day is this? Uh, the uh, 9th, 10th, oh, the 10th of September. They they put really weird uh, date formats in here. <laughs> but according to this article from SputnikNews.com, Facebook may know when users last had sex. 
How would they know something I don't even know myself? Uh, a spawning fresh data uh, in a privacy row. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> here it is. Highly sensitive information has been found ending up in Facebook hands as at least two smartphone applications have used Facebook analytics and app monetization software to transmit information even before data privacy agreement has had time to pop up on user displays. So before you get to saying it, you, you put an app in there and it pops up a privacy information deal uh, saying, do you want this to, you know, your information to go out or not? And, you know, you could say no or yes on that. But before that thing pops up and asks you whether or not you, you want that information to go out, the application takes your data and sends it off to the company that made the app. And then Facebook also has it. <laughs> oh, boy. Although menstrual, menstrual tracking apps, widely used by women across the world, really? Is that something you do? Menstrual tracking apps? <laughs> I can't even imagine. Whatever, used by women across the world, are thought to keep data entered safe and confidential. This appears to not quite be the case, with at least two applications in kind, Maya and MiaFem. According to the Britain-based privacy watchdog Privacy International, in a number of cases, personal details uh, self-recorded by users in the app contained information on when they last had sex. Oh, so you got to tell them, or tell the app first when you last had sex. They they can't just do a mind reading thing. What I thought, you know, I thought they were like, you know, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> my my tinfoil hat is still strapped on very tightly. Uh, the type of con con contraception used, etc. The watchdog went on to say the deeply intimate details were then shared with Facebook, Facebook using Software Development Kit, uh, a product that allows developers to create apps for certain operating systems, track analytics, um, as well as monetize apps. While concerns are mounting that advertisers and insurers are targeting certain social categories and potentially using data to discriminate against some of them. As flagged by Privacy International, both Maya and Mia started sharing data with Facebook the moment the user installed the app on their phone and opened it, before a user even had time to see the privacy policy details. However, a Facebook spokesman struck back, saying that Advertisers didn't have access to sensitive health information shared by these apps. Okay. The advertisers didn't have the information, but the app developer and Facebook did. But you see what he's trying to say when he says it the way he says it, trying to make it seem like, no, that information's not available. No, the information's just not available to advertisers which may be included or embedded as uh, many of the apps you install uh, have advertising things that pop up. They'll, they'll tell you before you install it, uh, in-app advertising or in-app purchases or things along those lines. Uh, but they're, they're, So they're saying that your sensitive health information is not available to the advertisers. It's still available to Facebook and to the app developer. <laughs> Uh, the social media giant does not leverage information gleaned from people's activity across other apps or websites. Right. Uh, and Facebook would never lie to you, right? They did that, but Vinny says Facebook uses its users. Uses, that's a friendly word for it. Earlier, several pregnancy tracking apps found themselves in hot water over reportedly sharing health data with female employees, uh, prompting users to give fake names and often insert inaccurate data. Facebook has long been in the crosshairs of watchdogs and private users due to the numerous pr data privacy scandals that it has been embroiled in, continues to be embroiled in. 
Uh, for instance, the social media platform recently agreed to pay a staggering $5 billion, staggering to you and me, not really staggering to Facebook, uh, due to violations of user privacy in a settlement reached with the uh, FTC in July of this year. The financial settlement is thought to be directly linked to the much-covered Cambridge Analytical scandal when the latter scraped through the records of hordes, you, that's you, you're the hordes, the hordes of Facebook users in a bid to allegedly use them to sway votes. Now, now how is telling if somebody's pregnant or when they last had sex or what their menstrual cycle is, how are you going to sway votes with that information? I don't know. Maybe they, they must have other information that they're using for that. But uh, I, I can't imagine the last time you've had sex. <laughs> Damn it, Facebook, I wanted you to tell me the last time I had sex. <laughs> but if you are having sex, say you're a male out there, you are having sex, maybe you're an older person, you know, over 40. Some of you may be under 40. I don't know. Anybody can have the problem at any age. A problem, I say. Uh, uh, maybe not that good to have at a certain time. But here's the thing that you don't want to do if, if, if you're not able to keep it going. If your stamina <laughs> is not where you'd like it to be <laughs> during one of them sexual encounters... This article posted on the DailyMail.com on uh, oh, 9th of September. Men are being urged to stop rubbing toothpaste onto their penises to last longer in bed over fears the, <laughs> the odd trend could cause burns and blisters. But maybe she wants that minty fresh taste. <laughs> oh god <laughs> tutorials on youtube promoting bogus claims have racked up millions of views creators of the video say it helps you last an extra 30 minutes in bed and stay harder but experts say oils and chemicals can inflict burns and blisters upon your genitals <laughs> British man <laughs> which you know it doesn't make you, you guys any larger over there you Brits you teeny, teeny little Brits uh, British men are being warned to stop smearing toothpaste on their penises as part of the bizarre trend that helps them last longer in bed the odd suggestion has no effect on sexual performance and could inflict burns and blisters on your genitals the peppermint oils and other chemicals in the toothpaste, including bleaching agents, can be extremely irritating to sensitive skin. And the bizarre technique puts women at high risk of contracting an infection in their vagina. YouTube videos describing how to apply the toothpaste have racked up billions of views. Oh, our recent video advises men to massage toothpaste into the tip of their penis to crush premature ejaculation and erectile dysfunction and last 30 minutes longer. <laughs> Hotly de debated posts have also been sprouting up on forums like Reddit and Steemit in recent months. <laughs> All right, I don't really need to go on with this, but uh, if you are interested, they do have videos here uh, involved uh, explaining to you how uh, you may want to uh, rub uh, some of that that toothpaste upon your wang to help yourself stay harder or uh, longer, although they say it doesn't work. Well, that's up to you, man. Um <laughs> I don't, I don't think my homemade toothpaste is going to do the trick on that, you know. It's only coconut oil and, and baking soda and a little bit of mint extract. So I, I, don't, I don't think that's going to do the trick. Um, <laughs> you probably need some of, the, some of that uh, pharmaceutical-grade toothpaste that you buy at the store. 
Um, <laughs> expert, yes, indeed. <laughs> oh, you chatters are funny folk. <laughs> All right, on to a not so funny article. A not so funny article. Uh, no, not actually speaking from experience. However, I mean, if you need a good lubricant, <laughs> the coconut oil would do a fine job. Um, anyway, <laughs> enough of that. On to the next article. <laughs> Posted on the com on September 10th. So, you know, the police, a lot of the police departments out there, have what they call a quota system. And supposedly these quota systems are illegal. And so they shouldn't actually have them. But suppose a well-meaning jackboot decided to speak up about these quota systems and report them to somebody. Suppose it was a bunch of them that got together and said, we're going to talk about this quota system because, you know, we don't like it. We don't agree with it. Not to mention the fact it makes us work harder than we need to. We don't like it. So what do you suppose, who do you suppose would come out on top if a group of these guys got together and said, we're going to tell about your quota system. We don't like it. It's illegal. It shouldn't be going on. Well, I'll tell you what's going to happen to them. They're all going to get fired! <laughs> Which, uh, you know, cops being fired, uh, it's not really a bad thing. But then they just put new ones in there to replace them that will agree to uh, not say anything about this nasty stuff. Anyway, after several officers came forward to expose the department's illegal quota system, they were all immediately fired without reason. Yes, indeedy. Uh, Collegedale, Tennessee. Most people reading this article know what it's like to have the blue and red lights pop up in the rearview mirror. The last thing going through your mind at this point is the feeling of, I'm being protected. Uh, this feeling comes from uh, the fact that the overwhelming majority of the of the time a driver sees police lights in his mirror is because they have been targeted for revenue collection, often the result of a quota system, and they are about to be given a ticket, or worse. Police, we are told, are here to keep us safe, of course that's a huge lie, and protect us from the bad guys, which they are the bad guys, so... How are they going to keep us safe or protect us from themselves unless they leave us the hell alone? However, public safety all too often takes a backseat to revenue collection. Time and time again, the Free Thought Project has exposed quota schemes in which officers were punished for not writing enough tickets. And the most recent ticket writing scheme to be exposed comes out of Collegedale, Tennessee, in which multiple officers claim they were fired for attempting to call out the illegal orders handed down to them to make arrests and write tickets. Former College Dale police officers Robert Bedell, Colby Duckett, and David Schilling have all filed lawsuits against the city and its officials for wrongful termination after speaking out against what they refer to is as an illegal quota system. <laughs> uh, I see Rome's catching up there. <laughs> Janie Parks Varnell, the attorney representing all three cops, argued the firings were just another example of the city of Collegedale Ch Chief Brian Hickman and city manager Ted Rogers terminating skilled officers simply because those officers brought attention to the illegal quota system implemented by the department. She added that Tennessee law protects public employees who bring attention to the illegal activities of their employers. I will be filing suit against the city manager Ted Rogers, Chief Brian Hickman, and the city of Collegedale 
for illegal firing of these outstanding officers who were serving and protecting our community by speaking out against illegal quotas, unlawful quotas. According to Bedell, who is a College Dale cop from January 2013 to January 2019, in December of 2018, the department began directing officers to make a certain number of arrests and citations or face disciplinary actions. Each officer had to complete at least 25 enforcement actions and 100 patrol activities per month, according to the lawsuit. But Dell's claim was backed up with photo evidence of, the, of a department flyer which had specific categories for officers to check off to show they had made their minimum number of arrests, citations, and patrols. When Bedell confronted Hickman about the quota system, Hickman told him that he could either resign from the department or be terminated. According to the lawsuit, as the Times Free Press points out, Bedell asked if he'd done something wrong, but Hickman told Bedell he could not discuss it, since, uh, and since Tennessee is an at-will state, Hickman could terminate Bedell at any time, the lawsuit states. Both Duckett and Schilling experienced firing, similar firings. Mandating that officers issue citations and make arrests is nothing close to protecting and serving. Of course, we all know cops have no duty whatsoever to protect or serve, as the Supreme Court has stated. In fact, it is quite the opposite. Requiring a minimum, minimum number of citations forces conflict and potentially hostile interactions in situations where there would otherwise be no conflict. It truly forces police officers to create criminals of innocent people in order to generate revenue or face losing their jobs. Sadly, Collegedale, Tennessee is not some isolated front. For years, the Free Thought Project has reported on these quota systems from coast to coast. As, as we just reported in June, the town of Ridgetop, Tennessee, fired its entire police department after they refused to enforce an illegal quota scheme in line with the pocket and, and line the pockets of city officials. If you truly want a glimpse into the mandated revenue collection schemes across the country and the penalties cops face for exposing them, take a look through our archives and they have a link right here to those archives that you can look and see all of this stuff. It is, I'd say it was disturbing, but it's not. Hansel, I am doing a show. I can't be looking at coffee mugs. <laughs> Apparently, however, you're not listening to the show. So, <laughs> uh, I am shocked and surprised, amazed. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Never mind. Let me get a quick sip of water here before I go on. <laughs> oh, man, let me tell you. Zerohedge.com, September 10th, 2019. Now, you all remember, I know you all remember, a mere, what was it, almost 12 years ago now? 10, 11, 12 years ago? The uh, Great Recession, I guess they called it. The super recession, the biggest recession since the Great Depression, and what it was caused by, or what they stated it was caused by anyway, which was uh, so many people getting these subprime home loans and then defaulting because of the creative financing that was done, and then what came after it, all the QE, all the banks getting tons and tons of fake printed money, or electronically generated money sent their way because they were too big to fail. Yes, indeed. If they let those big insolvent banks crash, which they were crashed anyway because they're insolvent, um, <laughs> that would be the end of everything. Well, for them, it would be the end of their fun in the casino. Uh, but anyway, here we are, a mere 10, 12 years later. And look what we have here. Shades of 2007. Only this time, it's cars. 
And a lot of times these days, cars cost as much as homes or more. And if you look at RVs, whew, <laughs> they are definitely more than homes. Anyway, <coughs> subprime auto lender verified income on only 3% of loans in latest bond. The U.S. subprime auto industry is doing everything in its power to recreate another 2008 crisis. After all, it takes a Potemkin village. One of the largest subprime auto finance companies, Satander Consumer, USA Holdings, verified the income on less than 3% of borrowers this year. <laughs> Just go in and tell them you're making money. They'll give you a loan. They don't care. According to Bloomberg and in uh, painful, painfully vivid shades, shares of 2008, shades, I would think they would say, it, it took those loans and bundled them into uh, more than $1 billion in bonds sold this year. This laughable number, which was taken straight from the countrywide playbook, if they can fog a mirror, we'll give them a loan, means if they're breathing in case you were unaware, uh, was down from the 17% for loans for various asset-backed securities issued as recent as 2017. For comparison, GM's Financial AmeriCredit, another major ABS issuer, verified income on about 68% of loans for a deal it priced in June and 66% of loans that it priced for a deal in March, according to Bloomberg. Why are these numbers not 100%? I understand that 68% is a pretty good thing compared to uh, a 3%. three There's no P in uh, the, that second P. Take that second P out. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, boy. And, uh, no, you didn't read that wrong. According to Moody's, which this time has no intention of getting blamed for the bursting of the biggest asset bubble in history, Santander's ABS priced in June had a had 2.6 of percent of loans verified for income, and the one priced prior had to that had 3.2 percent checked. Crazy, crazy. Just just walk in there and say, yeah, I, I make I make plenty of money. Give me a loan. I'll pay it back. I promise. I swear. <laughs> okay, I have no income, and I'm never going to pay this back. <laughs> another transaction, <laughs> another transaction uh, being marketed by Santander will also be in the 3% range or possibly lower, said Moody analysts. Borrowers involved, Potemkin, here, let me do this for you. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what it should be. Uh, 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 anyway, that, that's a, that's the proper spelling. So uh, maybe you can do a, a Google on that or something. All right, uh, or 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 DuckDuckGo. Anyway, so um, borrowers involved in the bond that Santander is currently marketing have an average FICO score of five eighty one. That's very low for those of you. Not aware of, of what a 581 means? Yes, that's very low. It means they're not good risks. And are paying an average annual interest rate of 18.9%. 18.9% on, on an auto loan. Crazy. What can possibly go wrong? Oh, wait. Everything. Because as Bloomberg notes, these ridiculous lax underwriting standards is why expected losses on Satander subprime auto bonds are higher than bonds from its peers. Yeah, I don't. I wouldn't be buying that bond if I were you. I don't care what kind of return they're promising. Moody's analyst Nikki Dang said, Moody's expects uh, average losses of up to 17% for loans underlying the bonds from Satander's uh, typical subprime series of transactions although its forecasts, uh, it losses, uh, hang on, they, they had, a, a, I think, a link to Satander? No. Potemkin. What do I talk about? Uh, no, they don't. Anyway. Um. 
<laughs> Getting the words confused here. Anyway, uh, uh, that's that's really enough of that. Just bear in mind that what I what 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 this this is not going to end well. <laughs> this is not going to end well either for uh, the, the loaning company Satander uh, or or others that buy their bonds. Yeah, th this is going to be a big mess. And of course, those those finance companies that wind up buying uh, these these loans, because that will happen. <laughs> oh my God! All right, <laughs> another quick sip of water here. <laughs> All right, you get emails, I get emails. We all get emails. And a lot of time those emails are spam. But sometimes those emails look legitimate. But they're not. Some are legitimate. You know the ones that should be legitimate. But sometimes you get very legitimate looking emails that are not legitimate. From maybe your bank, maybe a store that you buy stuff from. Uh, maybe a finance company, uh, whoever, insurance company, could be anybody. And and these 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 sneaky people out there, they'll make up emails that look exactly like the emails you might get from one of these institutions that send you emails. And they have links in them telling you, oh, go over here and verify your login information, or we've detected. Something wrong with your account. You need to go in and change your password. Be very careful. Very, very careful. And make sure that wherever you're going is where you think you're going. I would recommend, generally speaking, if you get an email from somebody like your bank, even if you do expect it, even if it's 100% expected, from your bank, your PayPal, uh, any place that you have a credit card on file, uh, any, any place that you've purchased anything from, don't don't click the link in the email. Go to their website and, and go through it that way. Find the information by going to the site. Because otherwise, well, you can still verify by, by, by the URL if you want to do it that way. But why take the risk? You know where you're going. You know how to type the the. Uh, the the address into into your address bar and your browser, so go directly to the site, and make sure that your site is the site and not some close to its site. Say it would be um, instead of bank dot com, maybe they changed it to bank dot co or bank dot net. I'm whatever I'm you know whatever your bank is. Um, make sure it's the right exact one, because if it's not. You could be a victim. And according to this article, which I, I don't definitely believe, posted on ZDNet.com, people are stupid. It doesn't exactly say people are stupid in the headline, but they're saying people are stupid. <laughs> this article posted September 9th. Cybersecurity. 99% of email attacks rely on you being stupid says relies on victims clicking links. Social engineering is by far the biggest factor in malicious hacking campaigns, warns researchers. So how can it be stopped? Quit being stupid. <laughs> Nearly all successful email-based cyber attacks require you, the target, to open files or just click on links to carry out some other action. While a tiny fraction of attacks rely on exploit kits and known software vulnerabilities to compromise systems, the vast majority of campaigns, 99%, require some level of your input to execute. These interactions can also enable macros so malicious code can be run. <laughs> exactly. Catholic Tech points out, maybe remind them that Microsoft will not call because your machine is infected. 
although you will get calls on your cell phone saying, we've detected something, please give us all your information. <laughs> oh my God. The finding comes from Proofpoint's annual Human Factor Report, a paper based on 18 months of data collected from the cybersecurity company's customers. Sometimes, it seems, it's easy to blame the users for falling victim to phishing attacks. It is, because generally they are. Um, but campaigns are becoming increasingly sophisticated. It's often difficult to distinguish a malicious email from a regular one, because attackers will tailor attacks to look as if they come from a trusted source, such as a cloud service provider like Microsoft or Google colleagues, or even the boss, which oftentimes you may get one from somebody you think, well, there's no way, way this guy this guy or girl will, would send me an email about this unless it was real. But if their machine was hacked, which I've gotten emails from people like my sister, good friends, uh, other folks, because their machine had been hacked, because they left it wide open, and whoever got in there downloaded their address book, which had my 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 email address, and then they made up an email looking like it was from them and sent it to me. And then I was like, "Why is this? Why are you?" And so I would contact that person independently from the email, only to find out they knew nothing about that and did not realize that their device, whatever it may have been, computer, phone, uh, tablet, whatever, had been hacked and all of their uh, contact information had been sent out. So <laughs> be very, very careful. Um, and if you do get something from somebody you know, just, yeah, I just want to watch out for that. Anyway, uh, it says a user might uh, be suspicious of an email claiming to be from a colleague that arrived in the middle of the night, but one which arrives in the middle of the working day is more likely to be treated as a legitimate email, with the potential for the victim to accidentally set, send the ball rolling for an attack. Phishing is one of the cheapest, easiest cyber attacks for criminals to deploy, but the reason it remains a cornerstone of hacking campaigns is because, put simply... Fishing works. <laughs> yes. And they're not fishing with, with an old Tom Sawyer Huck Finn pole. No, they're fishing with a commercial uh, fishing net. And they're throwing that net out there across as many possible people as they can and reel it back in. And some of those fish are going to be caught in that net. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's a problem. Cyber criminals are aggressively targeting people uh, because sending fraudulent emails, stealing credentials, and uploading malicious attachments to cloud applications is far easier and far more profitable than creating an expensive, time-consuming time exploit that has a high probability of failure. More than 99% of cyber attacks rely on you doing something dumb making individual users the last line of defense. To significantly reduce risk, organizations need a holistic, people-centric cybersecurity approach that includes effective security awareness training and layered defenses that provide visibility into their most attacked users. So just watch, be careful, you know, I know it's easy, real easy to say, oh, I'll just go ahead and click this link in this email that came from this friend of mine or that came from my banking institution. Don't do it. <laughs> well, try not to do it as much as possible anyway. I mean, if, if you just sent, like, uh, your, your bank a, a password reset thing and they send you a verification, you're probably Okay. And, you know, they sent that verification back to you at a reasonable time. And you check the URL. And the URL goes back to whatever it is, dot com, HTTPS, blah, 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 dot com. Uh, you're probably fine doing that one. But if you just get a random one at some point that that says, we we need to verify your credentials, don't do it. Don't freaking do it. <laughs> All right, 
Now, let me ask you once again. I know I said something at the top of the show, but let me ask you once again. You got your tinfoil hats on? Are they the industrial strength tinfoil hats? Are they firmly in place upon your head? I hope they are. I hope they are. Zerohedge.com, September 15th. It's a new world order, all right. Those winds just keep shifting. No matter what the Western press either uh, doesn't see them shift. Doesn't recognize them for what they are or chooses to ignore them. Because these winds bring tidings of a tectonic, plate-shaking shift in the global political climate. The fires in the Saudi oil installations, whether they were caused by drones or missiles, and whoever fired those are a major story, at least they were when this article was published, and rightly so, because they could shake up economies in a drastic way. But they may still not be the biggest story after all. Last Tuesday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced his intention to annex the Jordan Valley, already occupied territory, 65,000 Palestinians, 11,000 Israeli settlers live there. He did that to steal votes from the far right in next Tuesday's uh, the Knesset. Ken, Knesset? Did I say that? Election, which happened on September 17th. So this has already gone by. Uh, he didn't win or lose, really. It was kind of like a, a push on that on that one. Uh, but the uh, government went ahead, was the government, the uh, president uh, went ahead and selected Bibi to form a government, which he's in the process of doing at this point in time, although it doesn't seem to be going all that well. Of course, they, they could have picked either guy, because it was two guys, one guy running against the other one, and they picked... Bibi, that wants to do a whole Zionist thing, which he freely admitted. I'm not saying he did a Zionist thing because I'm kind of some kind of crazy anti-Semite. No, Bibi said I'm going to create a Zionist government uh, that 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 means Jews only. Jews only will be allowed. Anyway, <laughs> Bibi also called Donald Trump his friend every second word for that same purpose. Trump responded in kind. He may come to regret that. Choose your friends wisely. Yes, yeah, so a little background here on this from Russia Today. Uh, U.S.-Israel talk about mutual defense treaty, Trump. The U.S. and Israel are discussing a mutual defense treaty that would further cement the already tremendous alliance, tremendous, he loves that word, uh, alliance between the two countries. President Donald Trump has revealed, I had a call today with Prime Minister Netanyahu to discuss the possibility of moving forward with a mutual defense treaty between the U.S. and Israel that would further anchor the tremendous alliance between our two countries, Trump tweeted. Trump voiced uh, not that veiled support for Benjamin Netanyahu ahead of the upcoming parliamentary elections in Israel, I look forward to continuing those discussions after the Israeli elections when we meet at the UN later this month, Trump wrote. The support surely comes in handy as Netanyahu's backing appeared to be quite shaky. The September 17th polls are, which, which by the way, if you were watching the results coming in from the Israeli election during the election, it looked certain that Netanyahu was going to be out on his ass. But then it kind of wound up in this tie. Huh. Yeah, yeah not suspicious at all. Anyway, uh, the outcome of the upcoming vote is hard to predict. Now, we, we already, like I said, it's already happened. Anyway, let me, let me go down here a little bit. A second thing BB is trying to do is t uh, to win Tuesday's election is intimidating the prosecutors who were on his tail for three different cases of fraud. Fraud and a, a sitting leader? 
Sound familiar? All right. He has a grand plan to become immune from prosecution. Immune from prosecution? Wow. Didn't uh, Trump uh, tweet out today that he was immune from prosecution? <laughs> Basically, become king. King Bibi. But he must win the election to execute it. Haaretz is Israeli's oldest newspaper, but it's not Bibi's biggest fan club. <laughs> oh, and that's not all. Uh, the court was right to vote, uh, right, the court, to the, to court the right-wing vote. Let me get this stated right here. Bibi also planned to bomb locations in Syria. So bombing helps. Apparently, if you're on the, on a right winger, uh, by Iran backed quote unquote Assad troops, right about right now. Who's Trump gonna bomb? <laughs> and he needed permission to from Putin to do that, so he flew to Moscow, did a bunch of photo ops with Putin to show Israeli voters he's an important statesman. But all he all he got was a big load of coal in his stocking. Putin said, "Why we uh, what? Uh, we'll shoot you out of the skies if you dare." Okay, they forgot an L. We'll shoot you out of the skies if you dare. And do note, this is not the first time. In other words, Bibi was deeply humiliated one week before the elections. Uh, he so desperately needs to for him to stay out of jail. Now tell me, which pes <laughs> which Western paper or TV channel did you read or watch about this in on? Remember, this happened before Trump announced a mutual defense treaty with Bibi. By the way, what does that mutual mutual mean anyway? That Israel will save America? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, Israel will save America. That's gonna happen. <laughs> Zero Hedge reported Israel attacks on Syria halted after Russia threats to shoot down jets. So according to reports in both Israeli and Arabic regional media, uh, uh, Israel this past week was preparing to expand major airstrikes against Iran-backed targets in Syria. But Moscow imposed its red line. The Independent has published a, a story describing that Russia's military in Syria threatened to shoot down any invading Israeli warplanes using fighter jets or their S-400 systems. The Jerusalem Post, citing sources in the UK Independent, uh, Arabia, writes just after the latest meeting in Sochi between Netanyahu and Putin, According to the report, Moscow has prevented three Israeli airstrikes on three Syrian outposts recently, and even threatened any jets attempting such a thing would be shot down. All right, I, I, I realize I, I just realized I, I've, I've gone too far, too long on that article. Anyway, it's a new world order. You could believe it. You could buy it. It's for sure. Um, <laughs> but I do have one one last little thing that I need to share with you before I go. And it's not a little thing. It's a big thing. But I'm just going to give you a little bit, a little taste. From globalresearch.ca, posted on September 17th. Martial law masquerading as law and order. The police state's language of force. Or, as Solomon would tell you, it's not a police state. It's not a police state. It's a militarized state. You are under military global order. This is not a little police state where your nice protect and serve police guys are out there to help you in their little cars and their shiny little badges. No. You are living under a militarized world order. Militarized state. And if you don't think you are... You better just examine some of the things they say and how they say it, how they call you civilians, all the various things, all their terminology, and the equipment that they use, and the costumes that they wear. Anyway, this is posted by John Whitehead over here. 
I'm just going to give you the first little part, part, and then I'll then I'll jump off here. But uh, let me do this. Since when have we Americans been expected to bow submissively to authority and speak with awe and reverence to those who represent us, as if anybody represented us? The constitutional theory is that we, the people, are the sovereigns. Yeah, nice theory. And the state and the federal officials are our agents. Yeah, nice theory. We, who have the final word, can speak softly or angrily. We can seek to challenge and annoy as we need not stay docile and quiet. That, according to Justice William O. Douglas, a dissenting opinion on the Colton v. Kentucky 407 U.S. back in 1972. Forget everything you've ever been taught about free speech in America. It's all a freaking lie. There can be no free speech for the citizenry when the government speaks in a language of force. What is the language of force? Militarized per police, riot squads, camouflage gear, black uniforms, armored vehicles, mass arrests, pepper spray, tear gas, batons, strip searches, surveillance cameras, Kevlar vests, drones, lethal weapons, less than lethal weapons unleashed with deadly force, rubber bullets, water cannons, stun grenades, arrests of journalists, crowd control attacks, intimidation, intimidation of tactics, brutality. This is not the language of freedom. This is not the language of law and order. This is the language of force. Unfortunately, this is how the government, at all levels, federal, state, and local, now responds to those who exercise their First Amendment right to peacefully assemble in public, in public and challenge the status quo. The police overkill isn't just happening in troubled hotspots like Ferguson, Missouri, or Baltimore, Maryland, where police brutality gave rise to civil unrest, which was met with a militarized show of force that caused the whole stew of discontent to bubble over into violence. A decade earlier, the NYPD engaged in mass arrests of peaceful protesters, bystanders, legal observers, and journalists who had gathered for the 2004 Republican National Convention. The protesters were subjected to blanket fingerprinting and detained for more than 24 hours at a filthy, toxic pier that had, had been a bus depot. This particular exercise in police intimidation tactics cost New York City taxpayers nearly $18 million for what would become the largest potential settlement in history. Demonstrators, journalists, and legal observers have gathered in North Dakota to peacefully protest the Dakota Access Pipeline, reported being pepper sprayed, beaten with batons, and strip searched by police. In the college town of Charlottesville, Virginia, Protesters who took to the streets to peacefully express their disapproval of a planned KKK rally were held at bay by implacable lines of gun-wielding riot police. Only after a motley crew of Klansmen who had been safely escorted to and from the rally by black-garbed police did the assemble, assembled army of city, county, and state police declare the public gathering unlawful and proceed to unleash canisters of tear gas on the few remaining protesters to force them to disperse. More recently, this militarized exercise in intimidation, complete with an armored vehicle and army of police drones, reared its ugly head in the small town of Deholenga, Georgia, where 600 state and local militarized police clad in full riot gear, vastly outnumbered the 50 protesters and 150 counter-protesters who gathered to voice their approval and disapproval of the Trump administration policies. To be clear, this, this is the treatment being meted out to protesters across the political spectrum. The police does not discriminate. Anyway, there's, there's far more about this. It's a long, it's pretty, uh, fairly, fairly lengthy article. 
And I'll let you read it for yourself. But bear in mind, you're not living in a police state. You are living in a militarized state. And you can, well, thank Mr. Solomon for expressing that view time and time again when he used to call in on the Frickers Ball. We miss you, Solomon, wherever you are. Um, so, there you go. There you go. Anyway, thanks, everybody, for tuning in here to episode 42 of the Grim Leftovers program. I will be back next week with episode 43. Tomorrow, right here on RLM Radio, com. you're going to have Grammy and Flash in a perfect world, 1 p.m. Eastern. They're back, baby, they're back. Yes, indeed. <laughs> on Thursday uh, is uh, at... at uh, 11 p.m. Eastern, uh, you got the Prince and Poopster Power Hour at 11 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Vinny, be back. Yes, he's again. He's on again at his normal time, uh, which is uh, 1 p.m. Eastern on Fridays, uh, doing a ponder gander, uh, his radio writing, radio, 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 radio thing. Anyway, tune in <laughs> to Vinny at 1 p.m. Eastern on Friday. Uh, myself and the Moose Girl, We'll be back on Friday night, our normal time, 11 p.m. Eastern, Eastern with the Freakers Ball. And Saturday, yes, yeah, Saturday, the Dork Table is back again. Yes, we got Dorks, we got Grammy, we got Flash on Saturday at the Dork Table. Maybe some other guests sitting in. Who knows? Come on over, noon Eastern on uh, on Saturday. I'll be back on uh, Sunday with the Blues at, at noon Eastern for three hours leading right on up into Hal Anthony behind the woodshed, opening up that big old can of whoop-ass. And Solomon Vin E. Shouts out to you as well. All right, thank you all. I'll talk to you later. Have a great evening and a great rest of your week. Peace!